We are back and we are live. It is Fight IQ presented by Rotowire. Here to talk UFC Prague. Our main event is Jan Blahovic taking on Tiago Majeta Santos. I won't even mention the co-main event because it is weird. I will say the co-main event on this card is all the DraftKings line value we have to look forward to. And here to break it all down, I am your host of Fight IQ, the Daily Fantasy Sniper, the co-host and analyst. We have Chris Olson, who you can find on Twitter, at Real Chris Olson, and simply just Joe, who you can find better off on Twitter by the name you probably know him by, at <laughs> Sun Tzu. Guys, a lot of line line value. We have a we have a women's MMA fight to talk about for Joe with Joe that I'm actually really excited to talk about because I have a pretty strong opinion on it. Two women's fights. Two women's fights. One I have a really strong opinion on. Mm -hmm. um, bunch of line value to, to to look at. I already have my hot take queued up. There's going to be no hesitation for me on my hot take. I don't. I think our boy Zelda will be proud. That being said, overall, Joe, how do you like this card from a DraftKings perspective? I think, look, uh, for let's let's just backtrack a little. I did okay last week. Um, you know, obviously, I couldn't I couldn't decide going into the last fight who I needed more in Gano or or Kane because um, I was kind of riding I was riding one of those waves where I was up the entire slate and I didn't know who if I would lose or win with either one of those guys. So I think it worked out with Ngannou. I made money. I didn't take down anything major, but uh, I, I got back in the black, which was good. I think from a DraftKings perspective, um, this card offers some really good value. I mean, there's at least one guy at the top who is fadeable, not because I think he's going to lose, just because I think the the matchup is, is perhaps not the greatest um, for DraftKings. But you know, you mentioned incredible line value, and uh, I'll let you cue it up. I, I put a teaser out there um, that I've seen something on this slate that I have never seen since I started playing DFS MMA, and I'll leave it up to you, Sean, as to when you want me to give that away. My guess, well, I'm going to guess, and we haven't talked about it. Okay. We haven't talked about it. I'm going to guess, is it that you can make a lineup with six favorites on it? That's happened before. I can't remember. I can't. You're on the right. You're on the right track, but that has happened before. All right. Well, we will. You know what? We will. If it comes up organically, bring it up. Otherwise, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll go over a couple. Takes. We'll go over a couple of fights, and then I'll I'll let people. I don't want. I just don't want our mass viewership to shrink once I give away this little tidbit. So. All right. So so we will save that. We'll we'll make that part of the hot takes mm -hmm. right before the hot takes. Chris, are you gonna are you gonna go wild picking underdogs this week? There are a lot of live ones. Uh, I don't know about Wild, but I do think that this card is pretty interesting. I'm going to echo Joe's sentiments a little bit. I think this is a really um, interesting card, a good DK card to get your feet wet on. I, I think I like it more than the last three or four weeks. I think each of those were pretty challenging in their own ways. I think this one's a little more forgiving with uh, how li live some of the dogs are. But uh, before we kick off, I just want to mention that I, uh, I will be playing in my uh, – head-to-head -head round of the uh, DFS World Cup this week. Ooh, nice. And I, I know. Will, thank you. I will be playing against, I don't know if I would call him a regular viewer, but I have seen him in chat before, uh, Miley Virus. So if you're watching, um, I guess you get to have all my techniques free for this week, and uh, good luck if you are watching. Miley, oh, wow. you, you could have Miley's abstained, a Chris. Player. You could have abstained this week, you know? We could have oh, found... no, that, I, would never, I would never upset my adoring public that way. Okay. No. Miley, Miley's a sharp player, so good luck to both of you. Um, and somebody already in Twitter in, uh, on chat says they have a hot take ready. But you know what? You can you can save that, Otto. We will we'll all do hot takes together. Oh, Otto! Chat. Otto's the man. Otto. So, Otto is. You think I'm the chick whisperer? Otto is is a guy who really likes women's fights pretty much more, except for Robert Whitaker. He went to Australia. To see Robert Whitaker and Robert Whitaker didn't end up fighting. I feel so bad for the guy, but uh, he's like me. He watches Invicta and UFC. <laughs> I'd be bleeping furious. Yeah, I know, right? right. Let's get in, into some fights. Enough of the intro, except for I have to acknowledge our great sponsors at Rotowire. Make sure to go to rotowire.com/free. Check out all their premium content for ten days. No credit card required. Daily fantasy season long. All sports from NBA to soccer to MMA to NHL, MLB coming up. Check out all their great content over there. Now let's break down some fights. First up, Demir Ismagulov, 9,200, taking on Joel Alvarez, 
at 7,000. Is Magulov minus 290? Alvarez to come back plus 260. Is Magulov somebody I'm very high on? Joel Alvarez coming out of this, the. I was going to make a joke and say highly touted, but it's it's. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. The horrendous Spanish regional scene. Chris, we'll start with you this week. How do you have this fight? Yeah, this is um, the only question you're going to ask a- ask yourself here is uh, is Magulov is going to will he be worth it? I think you know. There's a um, if you never if you never saw uh, Jose Alvarez fight, first of all, Joel. Uh, Joel, don't even know his name. Joel Alvarez. And and if you have seen him fight, you've seen it on shaky cell phone camera footage. That's true. But also, you you if you haven't, you're one of the lucky ones because um, uh, you could you could you can save yourself a lot of time and just look at his sure dog page or or whatever your topology or whatever you prefer because you could get a lot of information about how he fights just by looking at his um, the way he finishes his fights. He's got 14 subs, I believe, out of his 15 wins. And if you go down, it's all like guillotine choke, triangle choke, uh, you know, Dars choke, just over and over and over again. And the reason for that is, is he gets taken down constantly and then just tries to, you know, hit some opportunity opportunistic submission. Now, as uh, Sean uh, referenced it, I mean, I'm sure that works wonders on, uh, you know, the AFL, the the uh, scene that he's on there, but. Um, I don't think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna play particularly well against um, this master of uh, master of sport uh, is Magulov here, who's a good solid wrestler. Um, he's good. He's got good stand up. He keeps distance well. He throws in combination. As I as I said in my open, uh, I think the price is a concern here, and the reason I say that is is because I wouldn't be surprised if this looks pretty similar to the Alex uh, Gorgie's fight. And even in that fight, when he where, when he got takedowns at will, he really didn't do all that much in terms of scoring. I believe he got like 84. And the price is similar here, so be aware. But just for um, if you're just looking for you know comfortability in your first pick, get your uh, foot in the water. I think Ismagulov is you know almost assured to win. Now I'm nervous, but I have a ton of Ismagulov. Uh, Joe, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I got into a friendly debate with someone in uh, DFS Army Slack the other night, and they're like, well, wow, look at all this guy's, you know, look at his submissions. And I tried to explain to him, and I think it's worth, it's worth you know, going going off off chart for a bit, that, you know, the, the kind of chokes that this guy gets is not indicative of someone who is a master technician in BJJ. Right, you know the triangle, the 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 rear naked chokes. I mean, there's no arm bars in there. There's no like leg lock. There's nothing like like outside of them. Those are typical chokes that you're going to get against fighters in a regional scene. Who you know their day job is like you know barista at tapa bars, right? So yeah, okay, let's yeah let's look at the record and say okay, the guy's like 14 and one or 15 and one. This is a Dagestani wrestler that he's facing. Now I expect I don't think that uh, the wrestler is going to be afraid of this guy's jujitsu game off his back and not go for takedowns. I would be shocked. So I would expect plenty of takedowns and decent grappling points. Obviously, you know who I'm picking here. Um, have a share of Alvarez if you like in in mass entry GPPs, but I would be very surprised if he actually won. All right, let's go on to Rustab Habilov, 8,700, taking on Diego Ferreira. That's right, it's not Carlos Diego Ferreira. It's just Diego Ferreira. Habilov, minus 145. A little bit of odds value here on Ferreira as the line is closed up. He's plus 135. Ferreira, BJJ specialist, but is coming off two straight knockouts. Rustab Habilov is a decision mach- is a decision machine who recently stole a decision and the job of Cajun Johnson in Russia last time out. He lost that fight. I will argue to no end that that Cajun Johnson won that fight. And I don't like Cajun Johnson. It's just a shame that that's how he lost his job because the UFC hates him and cut him. So let's, we'll move past that. Uh, Stylistically, is he going to want to take this down? I'm not so sure. And if this fight ends up on the ground, Tejeda is live, live to the sub with his BJJ. He's got more volume on the feet. His hands are improving. He just needs to not get knocked out. And Tejeda is one of the Two underdogs I'm picking on this card to win straight up. So give me Diego Fajeda at 7,500. How about for you, Joe? Well, I mean, I I posted on Twitter that I actually bet 
a parlay with with uh, Fiera in it before I even saw the DK salary. So um, that gives you an indication of the direction I'm going in. Now, it should be mentioned that he did miss weight um, by one pound, which I generally don't like to see. I like to see guys who miss weight by a lot uh, because that typically means they they just said, you know, what the F at some point and didn't really – um, you know, kill themselves to get it off. Usually when you're, you're, you're missing by a pound, you, you tried to make weight. So that does concern me a little bit, although there's been an unbelievable record of guys who missed weight and ended up winning. I should say guys, fighters. You it know. is starting to, to curtail. It's gone the other way the last couple. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. So um, I still like, uh, I'm going to still call him CDF just because it's a great abbreviation. I still like uh, Diego Fiera here. Um, I'm picking him for the upset as well. I'm not sure, you know, he didn't, he did struggle a little bit against Nelson in the first round. Nelson, maybe he had an adrenaline dump and just went all out realizing he didn't have three rounds of cardio. Um, but Nelson didn't look horrible against him in the first round. And then Fiera kind of got his shit together and, you know, that ended up, uh, he ended up being, doing okay there. So I'm going to go with Fiera. I think it's going to be a, a highly contested uh, fight, I'd be surprised if it ended in a finish. Um, so I'm looking kind of at a decision, but I think there's obviously value at his price point. So I am picking a dog as well. Chris? Yeah, uh, one thing to note here right off the bat is that if it does um, uh, finish, it probably won't be Hobby Love's win. Um, just just looking at the, his scores in the past, I don't know, however many fights, we have 54, 62, 71, 52. He's got a 102 in there, then an 86 win, then a loss, then a 66 win, and then a 97. So this is not a guy um, who is good DraftKings uh, fodder anyway, even if you like him. The reason for that is he's more of a control grappler on the ground and on the feet. He's a slow kickboxer. Um, I'm picking Fajara, too. The reason why I think that he had trouble with Kyle Nelson is that I think he has trouble with combination punchers in general a little bit because I, it looks to me like um, he sort of just tries to always throw back after the first punch and doesn't get himself out of the pocket and then gets hit with the second one. Uh, he's not going to have that problem here with Habilov, who is just a really slow one-shot uh, counterfighter. And um, I think he's basically going to be able to have basically all his own way on the feet. On the ground um, could obviously be an issue, but as you said, uh, Sean, active guard game. Um, uh, Cajun Johnson was at least active enough, you know, with leg locks and, and what have you to create sweeps and scrambles and get back to his feet. Uh, Habilov had some success in the second round, but overall, you know, there wasn't a lot of um, great control there. Um, I actually think all those things together makes this a pretty favorable matchup for Fajaya, so he's my pick as well. Wow. Three underdogs. All right, let's go to Michelle Prejeris, the most expensive fighter on the card at 9,400, taking on Ishmael Nerudiev at 6,800. Prejeris minus 405, Nerudiev plus 360. Chris, you're up first in this fight. Please don't overcomplicate this. Let's, we only have an hour here, so let's, I, uh, I let's not, speed through this quick one. Well, this, this, one. Is, this is another fighter where you can, you can basically um, find out a lot of what you need to know about him by – looking at the way he finishes his fights. If you look at if you look at him, a lot of his fights are like uh, spinning high kick and then punches, kick to the body. And, and that's basically um, the kind of fighter that he is. He likes to pressure you in and he likes to throw kicks at you. And he'll throw some straight punches, whatever, but that's basically his game. He's not even really a counter fighter per se. He just sort of uh, pressures you in and tries to create that offense, but he does it very slowly. He's another guy who gets put on his back a lot. Um, and for that reason, I like Pajaris here a lot. I, I don't think his opportunistic subs are, are going to come through either. I mean, I, I don't know if you could even fit your, your legs around uh, Pajaris' neck, let alone triangle him. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's, if that's going to be an issue. And I, I just think Pajaris is, is pretty much better everywhere. I mean, uh, he, he's not really a, a committed finisher, but we saw – um, beyond the shadow of a doubt that the power came with him in the last fight against uh, Bartosz Fabinski. I'm already going on too long. I can I can feel uh, Sean uh, grimacing over there. So I'll just say that I'm picking Prejeris by finish, and I think he's pretty safe here as well. The one thing I'll add is that 
the only thing is it does Prajeris lose focus because he was supposed to fight Rustab um, Amiv. I think it's his first name. He's supposed to fight Amiv, Amiev. That was going to be a really good fight. As long as he maintains focus, he should beat Rudiev. Um, Joe? Yeah, I mean, look. This is... Uh, I would almost have... Would rather have had the UFC scrap this fight. I mean, you've got a short-notice replacement making his debut in the UFC, fighting a guy who's got one of the the, the longest win streaks, you know, um, yeah. in the UFC, makes absolutely no sense. I mean, I don't understand, like, could they really not find anybody better? I mean, there always seems to be guys willing to step up on short notice. You know, you have to go with uh, – uh, now, you know, that's the concern. I mean, is – Priseris going to underestimate this guy. Maybe, you know, maybe he kind of eased up on his training. I hope not. I mean, this guy's a professional. He knows what's up. Um, the only question is, you know, will he earn his 9.4K salary? And um, I think in all likelihood, unless this guy is better than I and maybe others think, um, I have to put him down as a pretty solid play in both uh, both cash and GPPs. I mean, much better than, uh, you know, the guy directly below him. So uh, I am all in on Proceris here. I probably will probably be one of my higher owned guys in that 9K plus range. I don't want to oversell it, but just really quickly, um, even if he underestimates him, I don't even know if that's going to be. I mean, the guy just has no real tools. Right. <laughs> and and Proceris is old. I, don't I guess know. overestimate meaning that, it, you know, it, it ends up being a, a decision instead of like an aggressive finish. All right. That's fair enough. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about some line value. Polo Ray is 8,800, taking on Demir Hadzevic at 7,400. This line has flipped and then some. <laughs> I want to get the most accurate line on this one. Give me one second. It's I mean, actually it's 140, right? No, it's actually it's coming. It's leveling back out. We now have a pick 'em. Really? Yeah. It, at some books, it's minus 110 a piece. Five dimes is minus 115 plus 105. Um, another book, Pinnacle, is minus 125, mm, plus 100. So Demir Hadzivik was a bigger favorite. He's still a favorite, and he's still 7,400. Um, guys, Demir Hadzivik should be 1-3 and three in the UFC. He's 2-2 two and two because he got a third-round knockout over Marcin Held, where in a fight he was getting the ever-living you-know-what beat out of him. And then he has split decision win over Nick Hines. And, and now he's a big favorite here against a guy who – I know he hasn't fought good competition, but he's 4-1 in the UFC. He's been in there with James Vick, has good hand speed. Uh, someone explained to me why Demir Hadzvik is going to be about 75% owned in cash games probably. Uh, yeah. Joe, we'll start with you. Okay, so it's really – Reyes is a very inactive fighter, okay? Um, yeah, Obviously, everybody knows Reyes from that um, fight of the year against, you know, the fighter formerly known as Maestro Dung Young Kim, now Dung Young Ma. Um, who fought last week and got got lit up? Everybody knows him kind of from that fight, but if you he hasn't been very active. Um, this is pretty much a home fight for Demir. Um, you know, if he was ever going to get a, a decisive win, this is sort of his fight to get a decisive win at. Um, you know, I don't know what Polio Reyes has been doing and how he has been supporting himself. You know, fighting on average once a year. Um, you know, that's his business, but. I, I see the line value. I also saw um, some people on Twitter, um, you know, bet this aggressively, um, you know, when not everybody even had a line out um, on this. So I get it. I see the line value. Um, I am going to pick Demir here as well. I do think Reyes, and especially in mass market, um, his, his prohibitively high price is going to make him very low owned at 8.8K. But he does have an aggressive fighting style which could lead to a finish, perhaps early. Um, so I would advise maybe picking a few shares of him in mass entry, but I'm going to, again, go with the dog here. Chris? Well, I would agree with that last point. And, and uh, Joe, uh, Otto in the chat brought that up as well, that um, would it be a, a good uh, you know, a game theory play to, to have shares of a, a good, aggressive, powerful fighter like Reyes? Because no Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say yes. I know Joe likes doing that. That's one of my favorite things to do too. I don't know about it here just because I actually like Hadzevic a little bit here. I um, His last fight against Nick Hine, he was really showing a nice uh, stiff jab. 
And um, he went to split decision against Nick Hine. He went to, but it, but it shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have been. It was because the Germans, the Germans love Nick Hine, I guess. But um, it, he, he was showing a nice hard uh, jab. He was throwing a combination. He's a decent counter puncher. Um, he's pretty quick around the octagon. The, I, I, I love that jab in this matchup because I think that Polo Reyes likes to get in and throw in the pocket. And I think that jab could sort of keep him on the end of range. Now, if they get into a firefight, of course, I like it way less for Hadzovic. Um, we, we saw, we already saw Hadzovic knocked out in something of a firefight, uh, in the UFC against, um, Tysimov. So, um, you know, we know he can be hurt. We know that, um, uh, a good aggressive, powerful fighters can get to him. I just think that jab and, uh, and the, those kicks up the middle as well are going to be good range tools in, in this matchup. And, uh, I like Hadzovic to, Take a decision, but you know what? I, I wouldn't rule out stoppage here either. Uh, we know that Polo Reyes can be stopped, and uh, Hadjavik seems like a powerful dude. So, yeah, there it yeah, is. He's powerful, but it's, it's always got. Hadjavik, by the way, 2.6 significant strikes landed per minute. Not very active. I can't read Polo Reyes' numbers because it's, it's skewed a lot by that one um, – the one Duncan Ma fight, but he also he's a relatively inactive, inactive striker. Somebody in, in chat just mentioned Reyes' chin worries. I get that; that's a legit concern. I think Polo Reyes wins out because of his hand speed. But an interesting fight with ton of line value here. Although it's slowly going away, I'll see what it is come uh, tomorrow. But either way, Hadzovic will have value. Let's go to Jillian Robertson, eighty six hundred, taking on Veronica Macedo. At 7,600, Robertson minus 155. Come back on Macedo plus 145. Chris, break it down. Uh, yeah, I um, I this is a spot where I expect Robertson to be to be uh, popular again. And I'm not saying that I love Macedo here, but I don't get why people love uh, Robertson quite so much because um, she grapples. There, well, there's your no, answer. I, I get that part, but I mean. She got two quick subs against um, who Whitmire, and then she got one against um, uh, Molly McKinney. Yeah, so n not the best grapplers. And then the first time we see her in there against somebody who could compete with her in grappling, what happens? She gets subbed. So, but, but how does that apply to this fight? Because Macedo has a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and she she goes for opportunistic submissions. I mean, granted, her sub game mostly, isn't strong, man. They're mostly, huh? Her sub game isn't very strong. Well, I mean, look, it's there. I mean, she goes for opportunistic stuff like leg locks and stuff. I don't know what that's going to do, but we've we've already seen we've already seen Jillian Robertson guard subbed. So I mean, I I don't I can't say that it, it won't happen. Um, I like I like Macedo's movement on the feet. I still think that um, it lends itself to takedowns because she sort sort of sticks her leg w way out there. So you would think that single leg would be available to. Uh, to Robertson, I'm not. I'm not even saying I dislike her. I just think that um, she's so limited on the feet, um, and I think and I think people are overestimating um, her BJJ. I mean, she's not bad. What I what I actually like about her is she's very good positionally. Like she's she's always looking for that better position and always looking for that choke. But I I just I just don't know if her skills are up to what people have been chatting it up for. So I'm picking Robertson. I'm just saying. You know, there there is danger here. I mean, she's not somebody to trust a thousand percent. But there you go. I, I like Robertson quite a bit because Macedo has been taken down five times in her two UFC fights, and it was finished by Ashley Evan Smith. So I like Robertson a bit. But let's go to the women's MMA expert on the podcast, Joe. Well, look, um, I I do think that this is probably a more favorable matchup for Macedo that than she's had in the past. However. Um, I, I, I like Robinson Robertson here. She's 23 years old. She trains an American top team, um, against, you know, Mercedo who, who trains at, I think the MMA factory in France, at least that's what's on her topology page. And for some reason goes out with Roundtree. Um, but above and beyond that, I do think that, uh, Robertson is improving. Um, obviously there's killers at ATT, um, for her to train with. Uh, I was a little bit surprised. In her last fight, interestingly enough, um, I believe Macedo has got a higher belt in uh, BJJ uh, than 
uh, than Jillian Robertson, although we all know there are, are variations of, of belt quality. Um, so for whatever that's worth, but I like Robertson here. I think she will ultimately find her way to a submission. Uh, the one thing to be cautious of is if it does go the distance and you don't get the submission, um, you're probably, the ceiling is not going to be very high. Um, so again, this is a, a finish or she's going to have a fairly low floor. And at 8.6K, it's it's highly likely that if it goes to decision, uh, that Jillian Robertson will not earn value. So I would say have a few shares of Masato, but I like uh, Jillian Robertson here to bounce back. All right, Chris Fishgold, 9,000, taking on Danny Tamer at 7,200 in a fight that I think is pretty much a GPP fight here. The odds on it, by yeah. the way, are... Fish gold minus two thirty five. Danny Tamer plus two fifteen. Joe, break this one down. So, Fish Gold admitted that he had a bit of he had a bit of octagon jitters uh, in his last fight. I mean, this is obviously a guy who was a killer um, in in the UK. This is a perfect fight for him stylistically. Um, I, I do agree with you that this is likely a GPP fight. Um, I, I do see him getting the finish here. Um, Salary is fair at 9K, uh, probably has the best inside the distance odds, I believe. Um, definitely uh, picking fish gold here. I, you know, again, I hope he's gotten over his octagon jitters. So I am going to pick him here. Um, and I would recommend him more as a GPP versus a cash play. Chris? All right. So, um, it looks like we're getting spammed in the chat here. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know why the filter is not picking it up. But um, well, in any funny. event, uh, just hanging out with us. I don't know. It's some guy posting links in, the, in uh, Spanish. I don't know what it is. But um, uh, as far as this fight goes, I, I thought Fishgold actually looked pretty good against Calvin Cater. I think he was basically winning that fight until he lost it. Um, it he's got a really overpowering style. He likes to... Um, you know, just um, march you down and, and sort of throw hooks at you. Um, that fight, actually, the Cater fight, we actually saw him use a jab a little bit. We saw him counterpunch a little bit, so we saw that he might be adding stuff to his game, which is an encouraging sign. Um, the thing about Tamer that um, even if you don't like Fishgold, makes it hard to pick him, is um, he's just he's just a very, a very limited striker. He uh, throws he try he wings big overhands. He uh, you know throws kicks. But the reason why he gets so tired is he just throws everything to every shot. And it's not even like that they're clever shots. They're not set up. He just goes for broke on every shot. And, and, he, and he got submitted by a Golden Gloves boxer. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But that well, that's probably because he was so tired. He was so tired, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, does he, have, does he have the power to finish this fight? Sure. But, I mean, he, I don't think you can draw a lot of parallels between a guy like Calvin Cater Who's a who's a sharp boxer who's got a lot of range tools who knows how to finish who's got some pop too I mean they both do which I guess is the comparison but I I think Calvin Cater is a much different and much better fighter than a guy like David Tamer and so I think that um, I think that Fishko probably wins this year I don't know if he gets a finish um, I would have to see we have to see how he responds to actual takedowns because that that um. That uh, takedown finish that Joe alluded to was um, off a trip, so we don't know about that. But long story short, I'm taking Fishgold to win this because I just can't trust Tamer to a not get tired or b you know have enough tools to uh, go to war here. But um, you know it's probably a good GPP play if you're making a bunch of lineups. But the pick is Fishgold. Yeah, uh, Fishgold likes to get in wars, and Tamer throws everything into every shot. I I, I think this one ends in a finish, regardless of. Who you're picking, but I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm on fish gold. All right, next up, Carlo Petersali Jr., 8,200, taking on Dwight Grant at 8,000. Odds on this one, Peter Solly, minus 145. A little bit of odds value in the mid-range here. Dwight Grant, though, at 8,000. This is a fight I've been going back and forth on. Ultimately, I'm picking uh, my quick breakdown just in terms of picks, and I'll let, I'll let Chris give the analysis here, is I think Peter Solly is my pick to win the fight, and... Dwight Grant is the better DraftKings play, especially in GPPs. Chris? So, yeah, um, I, I was talking about this fight a little bit on Twitter. It, it's, just, it's just amazing to me when you watch that Zach Otto fight that he could have basically taken over the fight uh, whenever he wanted, and he just chose not to do it. At one point in the first round, he actually 
um, has has uh, Otto on the ground. Otto, I think, blocked the strike, and it was still powerful enough to send him to the ground. And he just lets him up to do what? Nothing, I guess. Stare at him and hope he throws so he can counter. Um, that's what he is. He's the ultimate counter striker. In his contender series fight, he had a guy who was very willing to lead at him. So that fight ended in a knockout. Um, Petr Soli might be able to lead, might be willing to lead at him too here. But I think the reason why I'm picking Petr Soli is, um, th you know, there's this voice in my head that's like, Dwight Grant is so powerful and explosive, he's going to catch him and knock him out. But I think I'm going to ignore that because I think, like, logically what I see happening is Petr Soli is a guy who likes to pressure and, and, get, and use his kicking game. And so what I think is going to be the most likely outcome is Petr Soli just keeps him on the end, uh, keeps him on the outside with those kicks for most of the fight and probably picks him apart in a decision that way and sort of integrates his wrestling and, and sort of has a whole thing going. Um, Dwight Grant can obviously catch him, and I expect that he'll be very low owned because I expect um, many owners will be sour on him because of that last performance. So if you like it in GPPs, go for it. I mean, it's the, the potential is definitely there. I don't think he can be trusted. I like Petr Soli's game a little better. That's who I'm taking. Yeah, Dwight Grant, what, the things with him is that after the Zach Otto fight, got a lot of power, usually pulls the trigger. Hopefully he gets over that. Could have been octagon jitters as well for him. What's interesting is that, to me anyway, Carlo Peter Sally Jr., the way I, I, I'm barely picking him, is he got knocked out by Alex Oliveira. Yeah, he was thrown in the deep end, but Alex Oliveira changes the lives of some of these dudes. You should go back. I, I did the I've done the exercise previously. Go look at the fights Alex Oliveira's had. Watch the guys he's knocked out, and then go watch their next fight or next couple fights. Or in some cases, he's retired guys. Ryan Lafleur. Um, there's another one. Um, uh, KJ Noons, maybe. Somebody like, like he's retired people. Like, dude hit so hard. He seems people don't seem to be the same. It's just it's an extra narrative. It could it could be coincidence, but he's also coming back from a knockout. So that's why I like Grant and GPPs. But ultimately, I do think those kicks on the outside will be an issue. Uh, Joe, how about for you for this? Fight? Yeah, I'll be honest. I haven't thought a whole lot about this fight. There's just so much more value um, odds above and below. Uh, however, you know it could be a sneaky fight to target for game theory. I could see both of these guys. I mean, usually when you see guys at 8.2 and 8, you know, it, it's a fight to target because, you know, there's some doubt as to, you know, what side is going to win and people expect equal ownership. And that might be true here. It's just there's so much more value on this slate that I don't know that this fight will be that highly targeted. Um, you know, with that said, uh, you know, Grant has got knockout potential. Um, I'm still going to go the other way here in kind of a sloppy type of decision, low scoring. Um, I will have shares of each guy, um, but I'm not going to be overly exposed to the fight as a whole. All right. Magomed Ankalaev, 9,100, taking on Clidson Abreu. The odds on this fight. Clidson Abreu is the dog, plus 180. Ankalaev, the favorite at minus 195. Another Dagestani wrestler. Joe, how do you have this one? Look, I'm surprised, uh, you know, that this line is not a bit wider, frankly, unless it's semi-recency bias here. Obviously, Uncle Lev is the guy who... That's what it uh, is. ...with one second remaining uh, tapped out to, um, you know, uh, the Bear Jew, <laughs> Paul Craig. Uh, I, uh, I, I still question, like, like, what is Russian for there's only one second left, don't tap? Because I can't imagine, like, his corner, once they saw him you know, in the submission hold, like, didn't yell. Like, all you got to do is hold on for five seconds. Yeah, and fence that. I, mean, I, I said this on my podcast. I give him a pass on that because unless you've been in a triangle choke or cho – like, you're not hearing. Now, he should have the fight IQ or maybe, say, the toughness to let himself go out. But once you're in that spot, you, you don't you don't hear. You don't think right. I get like, it. I get it. It's, it's different. I, I'll I, give him a pass on that. I mean, is is this guy a bru a Breu? A bru? Is he a short notice replacement as well as making his UFC debut? No, I don't think so. Okay, I I don't understand the matchmaking then. Um, I I'm gonna pick Uncle F here. Obviously, I I think he's a pretty good fighter to target, um, both in uh, GPPs and cash. Chris, how about for you? So when I first looked at this fight, the first guy I looked at was uh, Klitson, and I said, "Hey, here's here's a promising looking dog. He's got." Um, 
you know, he's got decent wrestling. He's a really good um, uh, jujitsu player. He's he won't get killed if it, they have to have a kickboxing match. If he can come forward, you know, he's got um, pretty decent hands. He actually counters pretty well, which is amazing for like just a, a straight jujitsu guy. But um, if you're if you're thinking along those lines, if you like um, Klitson, and I know we have uh, someone in chat who wants all of the Klitson. Otto wants all of it. So um, I don't know if this will change your mind or not, but um, I think you should probably go and you can find it on YouTube. Watch his fight against a per, a gentleman named Bruno Enrique Cap Capozola, who was um, I think the last fight he lost in Jungle Fight. It's on YouTube. Just type in their names. Um, Bruno Enrique is a a um, come forward striker who's a good wrestler. So what happened there? Well, he he um, pushed him against the uh, the cage, pressured him, uh, stuffed his takedowns, and um, ultimately wore him down and knocked him out. And I could see this fight going the exact same way with Ankalaev, if not stuffing every takedown, then at least creating scrambles good enough to get back to his feet. And I think Klitschin really needs to be the one applying the pressure in order to be successful. I don't think he's going to be that here. I think Ankalaev is going to take that away from him. And I don't think he fights as well backing up. I said he could counterpunch a little bit, but, you know, it's certainly not something he wants to do. And I think that Ankalaev is just going to be the, the – the, he's got the faster hands. He's going to be, as I said, pressuring. And I don't think Klitson is going to be able to reliably get takedowns. So I think that spells a Ankalaev knockout. And to me, Abreu is one of those Brazilian guys, slightly inflated record, has fought at heavyweight, heavy hands, but relying on the sub. I don't like guys who are just reliant on the sub. Uh, if I'm going to take a shot, yeah. For me, I just I'm not I'm not on a bray you here. Uh, someone in chat did mention thank, thanks to Gerwin, um, not short notice, but a bray you is replacing Darko Stosic. Yes, uh, who which he beat, uh, Jeremy Kimball in his first fight. Yep, yeah, yippee. That would have been a much better fight. You know, we're going to mention Jeremy Kimball another time on this podcast, which is just, oh goody, which is oh for uh for Pizzau, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't believe we're going to do that anyway. Peter Jan 9300. John Dodson, 6,900. I mean, Joe alluded to it before, but I don't think it's any secret. This is the the high-priced fighter on the card who is super talented, but um, probably not a great DraftKings play this week unless you want to just go under own in game theory. Peter Jan, minus 290. Dodson, plus 260. I don't mind Dodson as a cash punt. He just he doesn't get finished. In and out movement. Perennial gatekeeper. Should land 50 to 60 strikes. I mean, there's you probably... You might not need it because of all the odds value on this card, but yeah, not much interest in Jan, though I do think he wins and cracks the top five in this division, if not after this win, very, very soon. Chris? Yeah, um, I think this fight is pretty straightforward as far as what you have to ask yourself, and it's can Jimmy, uh, can, uh, can Jimmy, can um, John Dotson's speed save him here? Um, it couldn't against Jimmy Rivera, which is why I mix those names up. But I also think Jimmy Rivera is is faster than Peter Jan. So I think that um, Dotson's speed is going to serve him kind of well here. The thing you have to um, think – the other thing you have to ask yourself, so I guess two questions, is um, is, his, is his suffocating pressuring style going to be too much? We saw John Dotson fare well against uh, a rel relentless pressure in um, – in Pedro Munoz, but obviously the boxing talent, the footwork is night and day, so that's not entirely comparable. Um, he was able to move in and out at will. I think Dotson's going to do a better job of trying to wall him off. But, um, look, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think I sort of peren perennially underrate uh, Peter Jan because probably because he gets hit too much, I think, and I don't like the way he shells and backs up when he gets hit. Not that he can't counterpunch. He does that some too. Um, and he's very tricky, uh, switching stances and giving you different reads and, and, and throwing in combination. Um, I do think that uh, this fight is probably going to be like um, maybe like an ugly decision where not much happens. And so if you think Dotson can pick off a, a decision that way, I think maybe uh, maybe he's a good play at 6,900. He's definitely worth looking at because um, it's not that often where you get a fighter of this caliber at that price. But... Um, I just, I just think Jan is going to uh, probably wall him off and be a little too much. So I am picking Jan to win, but I wouldn't totally fade um, 
Dotson if you like a bunch of the 9,000 plus guys. Joe, how about for you? So you alluded to it, Sean, like two slates ago, Dotson would probably be like north of 30% owned, uh, you know, dog because, you know, there was nobody to back, you know, as a dog uh, two slates ago. Um, you know, on this slate, you, you alluded to the, the line value elsewhere in, in the 7K range. So I don't think you need to go to Dotson here, you know, in cash or otherwise. I think there's there's other value that you could chase. Um, I And, on you know, as it relates to Peter Jan, I, I, I'm picking Jan to win, but I just see, you know, Dotson being on his bike the entire fight. And if, if Jan can't catch him, um, which, you know, at least for the first two rounds, he might maybe Dotson gets a little tired in the third round. Uh, it's going to be kind of an ugly fight. I mean, not very high scoring, and and Jan is 9.3K. I think Jan is a much better bet here than a DraftKings play. Um, I will have some shares of Jan. Um, you know, I'll have a few shares of Dotson, but I don't honestly think you need to play either one here. You know, there's plenty of value in the 9K range. There's plenty of odds value in the 7K range. Uh, if you're doing 150 in the mass entry, yeah, have some shares of each guy, but um, you don't need to be overexposed to either one of these fighters on this slate. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Uh, if anything, I probably would play a little bit of – I'd consider – I'm still considering Dodson and Cash, but again, the odds value – I had to decide if I'm going to stick to my guns or go with some of the line value. We'll see. I would consider Dodson to play in cash and maybe one or two shares in my 20. I know you play like 100, 150 in my 20, one or two shares maybe of Peter Young just for game theory. But, again, I agree. Not a not a really interesting DraftKings fight. Liz Carmouche, 8,300, taking on Lucy Pudalova at 7,900. Carmouche minus 130, Pudalova plus 120. Pudalova, the only Czech fighter on the card, defending home soil against Liz Carmouche, who is um, getting up there in fight years. She's a grappler. Pudalova, I think, can be taken down. Usually Pudalova is the stronger fighter, has the advantage in the clinch. She's not going to be stronger here. Liz Carmouche is crazy strong. Pudalova will have the advantage on the feet. Carmouche looking for takedowns. Striker versus grappler. I always lean towards the grappler in this one, but I don't think there's a high ceiling in on, on this in this fight. This is more of either a cash fight if you have a strong opinion on it, or maybe for me, just a little bit of Liz Carmouche in tournaments. Um, not much beyond that for me, but Joe, you're the expert. What do you got? Yeah, so um, Hudlova is who you want to win here, probably being the only local fighter on the card, 24 years old. Um, I hope that when she loses, um, she will get a, a another fight in the UFC. Uh, Carmouche, on the other hand, is a beast. Um, kind of getting up there in age, um, you know, making a run. Obviously, had previously fought at bantamweight, you know, making sort of that last run at uh, 125. Um, actually, you know, her last fight against uh, Jennifer Maya, who was uh, – Fairly acclaimed in Invicta was riding a, you know, pretty sizable win streak. I want to say she had won her last six fights in Invicta, and uh, Carmouche won a, a, a unanimous decision um, at, you know, I think minus one thirty-five. Um, I think just Carmouche is going to muscle her here. Um, I don't know that she's going to allow the fight to remain standing. I do agree that I don't see the highest ceiling on this fight. Um, if you want to have a few shares, um, of either fighter in mass entries, fine. I just think there's more value elsewhere. Um, as much as I want Pudlova to win, I, I remember that fight against, uh, the elbow princess, uh, Landsberg. What a bloody, that was one of the bloodiest female fights I think I've ever seen. I think circa Penne, Joanna John Jacek might've been bloodier, but that was a one hell of a bloody fight. Um, so I'm going to pick Carmouche, although I'd like to see probably Pudlova win. Um, I will have a few shares of each fighter, nothing much. Chris, how about for you? Well, and then she had a bloody fight with uh, Irene Aldana, so there's blood yeah. all around. In, uh, decision, right, in that fight, yeah. So, but um, I actually like uh, Carmouche a little bit here. I think the reason why is um, Pudlova just sort of likes to, likes to chase you around with strikes and try to get in your face. 
And that's pretty much what, what Liz Carmouche needs so she can body lock you and take you to the ground. And I think she's going to be able to do that pretty much whenever she wants. Um, I also think that um, – I think it needs to be said that Liz Carmouche is better on the feet than maybe some people give her credit for. We just think of her as a wrestler. But um, she's actually pretty light on her feet. Um, she's pretty good defensively. And her hands are, her hands are actually pretty quick. Um, so if it, if it has to be that, I think she could do okay in the striking. But um, I think the main factor here is just um, – She's going to be coming forward, and she's going to give Liz Carmouche um, just plenty of grappling exchange opportunities. I hope she takes advantage of them. Um, she's she does. I think the reason why she doesn't score as much is because sometimes she forgets that she should be getting going for the takedown. I hope that doesn't happen here. I hope she just tries to wrestle the whole fight. And I really think like I think that this one should be hers. All right, moving on. Mikhail Oleg Jacek, eighty nine hundred, taking on. Jean Valente at 7,300. Old Jacek minus 185. Comeback on Valente is plus 170. Somebody asked earlier in, in chat if I would rather play Oleg Jacek or Robertson in cash, and I snap answered Robertson, and it's because Jean Valente is the second underdog. And there's some foreshadowing for you. The second underdog I am picking, second and final underdog I am picking to win on this card condolences <laughs> condolences is right nope we'll, we'll get there guys um on this fight or the main uh this fight man this fight look you're gonna trust mikhail old who is no. one and, who is who is one and oh in the ufc his one win is to khalil roundtree against khalil roundtree jr who beat the ever living snot out of him until he gassed out and then mikhail took him down Mikhail Oljajic needs fights to get to the ground to win them. John Vellante, despite being a big stupid, is has 86% takedown defense. The worry with, with John Vellante is that he takes one to give one. He's will tire towards the end of the fight, but I, I don't think Mikhail Oljajic is, is any kind of great athlete, and he's coming off of a one-year USADA suspension. I think this fight should be pick him, and then I would have a slight lean towards Volante. So I'm still picking him to win straight up, but at these odds and price, Volante, I don't see him getting finished by, by Mikhail Olegzhejuk. Maybe he gets robbed in a decision. He fights close constantly. I know his last win was a split decision against Ed Herman. Look, I just think people are overrating Mikhail Olegzhejuk here and <clears throat> are looking at Jean Volante in his past history, and I get that it's not good, but... That doesn't mean the guy he's facing is going is going to win or is any good. So that's that's my cautionary tale there. I like Jean Vellante especially for the price. Chris, go ahead. You can berate me first. I've been I I was I was so good during that. I didn't say a word, but now I'm I'm gonna. Uh, I think first I have to give you some credit. I think the big stupid should be his actual nickname. I love that nickname, the big stupid. Bobby for that. But um, look, I don't think I don't think we are in love with Olin Jacek as much as we're just. We, we just got off of, of the train at, at uh, John Volante Station. I, I just think that's it. I think, um, look, John Volante can't win that many fights at, at light heavyweight for the same reason a guy like, um, what's his name, Justin Ledeck can't, because all of these guys are going to be more athletic than him, basically. Unless he's fighting like Ed Herman or Sam Alvey, all these guys are going to be more athletic than him. Uh, Olin Jacek falls into that category. He's got way faster hands, which goes without saying. He's a good combination puncher. He was doing great body work against a guy like Roundtree. And you understand, Roundtree was exhausted. Uh, done. Well, not for the first minute and a half of every round he wasn't. And, he, you know, he, he faded that out. And you got to understand that a guy like um, Khalil Roundtree, he's got his issues, which is like he gets really tired. But until he gets tired, he's really athletic and really powerful. And um, probably more so than John Volante in either department, although the power might be close. But um, if he could weather that storm, I really see him. I really see him not really having that many problems with Volante. The one thing I did see for Volante was that I noticed on tape that um, uh, Alan Jacek doesn't really fight that well when he has to back up. So that was the one thing where I was like, well, maybe. But I still can't trust Volante uh, to do anything about it because. He just fights in these predictable patterns, like uh, one twos and overhands. Occasionally, he'll throw like a leg kick or something, and it's all just so slow. I mean, look, I, I understand it to an extent, but I I just can't do it. I got to pick Olin Jacek here. 
Good. I'll be all alone on the John Belante train this week. And I've bad mouthed him plenty, including when I was when I was picking him. So we'll see. Well, I'm gonna be alone. So if he wins, I'm gonna have a very good week. And you know what? Sometimes you gotta take a stand. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But uh. quite a stand, my friend. Can Joe? I, I, okay. I so bravery. Where I will agree is I, I I'm not sure I get the line. Um, of one of minus 195, especially coming off of a one-year suspension. Look, he is only 24 years old. Um, I would have loved to have seen him use that time to maybe, you know, go to a better camp. Um, uh, but I, I see this fight as basically a toss-up. I'm not going to be heavy on either guy. Um, you know, Volante's had his moments. You know, he has just got leagues more experience than uh, – you know, than McCall, and, you know, that could mean something in a fight like this. Um, although, you know, Volante is 33 years old, and as my dad would say, it's time to shit or get off the pot. Um, he needs a win here. Um, you know, I, I can't believe how long he's been in, you know, both the UFC and Strike Force. I mean, he's he's got fights going way back, Volante. So, and he's always been billed as the athlete because I guess he played lacrosse or something. He um, play, didn't football. he play football at Hofstra? He's a wrestler too. I thought he, I thought he played lacrosse. Yeah. I you know anyway. So I, I am going to give a slight nod to Mikhail, but it's not a minus one ninety five fight. Um, you know I will have my shares of him, but I don't love him. Um, I have a question for the group, if I may. What does John Volante do well? Nothing. Right. No. Well, I'm asking Sean. Really, I guess I mean, he does nothing well. It's just what is it, it's just. He does one thing really, really well. He has what? really good takedown defense. Okay. okay. Uh, he gets tired while he's defending takedowns. Yeah. But he gets but he's defense at 86% and Corey Anderson didn't take him down for three rounds. You're gonna tell me he doesn't have good takedown defense? Okay, so you, does, we but can but disagree, but you know I'm right here. I, I but what's the but I mean I don't know why you're leaning so heavy on that this dude needs takedowns. I mean, you you saw I mean, would you agree with me that he's a diverse striker who's quick? Like, why would I don't he think he's that him? quick. I don't think he's that quick. Is he quicker than John Volante? Probably. Oh, come on. Hand speed, probably. And foot speed. He's probably faster. Know. But okay, thank so you. In summary, Sean's got Volante. I was uh, getting nervous. Chris has got the other guy, and I'm kind of on the fence with a lean. If, if, if you're if you're gonna pick, out. if you're going to play Oleg Jayshuk at that price, I think you're crazy. Oh, I'm not. I'm not going that far. I'm just saying. I mean, maybe leave it alone if the you want. Price per dollar. Volante is the better play. And someone in chat, uh, my client own, Matt Sarah. I'm reading this live. I've read this before. Matt Sarah. Jean Volante is awesome on the ground, but he refuses to shoot takedowns because he wants knockouts. Yeah. So he proves my point. He's a big dum dum. I'm still picking him. <laughs> hey, I said Jeff I love the nickname. If if you want to do, the, I'll get behind you on that all day long. We could. Yeah, the big dum dum. I love it. Uh, all right, let's talk about the co-main event, which is – how is this the co-main event? How is Peter Yan, John Dodson not the main event? I don't know, dude. Or yeah, they event. probably see this as, as finishing. That's probably Stephen why. Stefan Struve, 7,800. Marcos Ruggiero de Lima, 8,400. Line uh, flip, line uh, flip. Has it, uh, has it flipped? Yep. Yes, yeah, Stefan Struve, minus 110. Marcos Ruggiero de Lima, plus 100. Um uh, Stefan Struve, 0 3 in his last three, but it's Arlovsky, Volkov, Tibora. Was taken down a bunch, and Marcos Ruggiero de Lima only seems to beat guys like Jeremy Kimball. And um, the last one was Adam Wojcik. Look, it's how done is Stefan Struve. This fight is, for me, it's GPP. I don't care about the odds value here. It's, it's a GPP fight. And honestly, neither one of these guys strike me as quick finishers. So I might not be, I'm not 100% exposed to it. I give me Rogerio de Lima for the takedowns and Struve not finding a sub, but anything happening in this heavyweight fight really wouldn't surprise me. De Lima's my, my pick, but whatever on it. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I mean, so de Lima was this guy who who could never make light heavyweight, 205. So his first fight uh, at heavyweight, he comes, they make him move up to heavyweight, and he comes in at 253. <laughs> um, you know, so obviously... Uh, you know, and I, I haven't seen weigh-ins yet. I'd like to see how he looked. Um, you know, Struve is this guy that has never learned to fight big. He's seven feet tall. 
always has a, a reach advantage over whoever he fights. This is a guy who knocked out Stipe Miocic. I mean, that's what this guy's pedigree looks like. He is also an extremely nervous and anxious fighter. I mean, he's had panic attacks. He's had to have a fight called off the day of because of a panic attack. He's known for throwing up in the locker room, right? So this guy's got all kinds of issues. This is a good fight for him. I could certainly see him after the, you know, the guys that he's fought, you know, if he is still vested, he's only 31 years old. If he's still vested and look is looking to actually continue fighting, I believe this is the last fight on his UFC contract. So if he's going to go elsewhere or try to get re-signed by, you know, he, this is a very winnable fight for him. You know, with that said, you know, if he is just fighting out his contract, I could certainly see the Lima catching him. Although the quality of competition that the Lima has beaten is not great. I don't think he's a great overall fighter. It's just there's so little depth at heavyweight that, you know, they'll probably keep him around for a while. So initially I was kind of on Delima. And now I'm kind of flip-flopping back and forth. I really do see the line value at 7.8K. And I do see that this is a fight that Struve could potentially win. So even though, you know, I didn't officially pick the Lima anywhere, I'm going to um, take Struve here. At, uh, I'm going to, I like him on DraftKings at 7.8K. I would certainly not invest a lot in him. I think he might be a better DraftKings play than a bet. Um, but 7.8K, yeah, give me some shares. Give me shares at Delima. I'm going to be pretty equally exposed to each fighter, maybe have uh, more of Struve because of the, the line value and the salary, but I am going to uh, pick the upset here, and the skyscraper gets a W. Chris? Yeah, um, I'm going to disagree uh, with you, Sean, off the bat, that um, I actually think this is a good fight to finish just based on um, – on the fact that most early of the time, finish, quick finish. Well, well, most of the time when these dudes win, they finish, and most of the time when they lose, they don't, uh, or get finished, I should say. Um, the reason why, like this, this fight to me is is so weird. And I was going back and forth on it. I I, I almost wanted to pick Struve because he, for some reason, which I don't know why, he actually showed a lot of promising things in that last fight. He was finally working behind the jab, which is. The first time I've ever seen him do that, he was using his front kicks up the middle a lot. Um, he actually caught uh, Marcin Tabera with a, with a front kick to the face and, you know, just couldn't capitalize because Tabera had a reactive double off of it. But um, he, was, he was doing some, some good things. The reason why I'm ultimately going to be picking the Lima here is because um, he, his, his game just looked way more put together in that fight against uh, Adam Wojerik. Like, yeah, pressure – throw those hammer leg kicks, um, uh, wing the hooks, or pr uh, try to pressure and counter it and wing the hooks out. I mean, I am I am really pretty nervous about the fact that if he goes for a takedown, he will get lazy and just sort of fall into Screw's guard and get triangled or something. You have to remember, this is not only the guy, a guy in the Lima who um, was, was um, bomb flu choked by OSP, but also – allowed himself to be guillotined by Antigulov when he could basically have just stepped over into side control whenever he wanted, allowed Antigulov to, to wrap up the guard, and then didn't fight the hands and just tap. It was um, pretty baffling. I, I, so you have to be worry, uh, weary, that is, of, of um, you know, Delima just being weird and not doing the things he's supposed to, not showing a lot of urgency. But I think his game is put together a little bit better. And so I have to pick him, but this is this is um, a tough one to get. All right, let's go on to our main event: Tiago Santos, eighty-five hundred, taking on Jan Blahovic, seventy-seven hundred. And here's another big odds value spot, as the line has is actually flipped now. It's not minus one ten a piece. It is Jan Blahovic minus one ten. Tiago Santos plus one hundred which is annoying to me because I have bet Tiago Santos in this spot. I am not on the Jan Blahovic train. I am jumping off. I have been on it for the longest time. Everyone else seems to be joining me. I cash as an underdog in Jimmy Manoa and in other spots in his little run here. He's back on the juice, by the way, for sure. Uh, Tiago Santos has looked like a different guy since going to 205, as many people do. Good volume, gets in wars. Those leg kicks are, you know, we all know they're just, they are devastating. Probably the best, 
not leg kicks, but best body kick, high kick in mixed martial arts, I think, goes to Tiago Santos. It's just so damn powerful. Uh, I don't think Jan Blavich will have enough to take him down and hold him there, which is his path to victory. Santos, though, if this fight gets into late round three, four, five, it will go towards Jan Blahovic. I don't mind stacking this fight in cash. I think the odds value pushes everybody towards Blahovic, and I like Santos to win, so I will be heavier on Tiago Santos. I think eventually he is going to catch Blahovic moving in for a takedown and finish him. Um, Chris, main event time. Take us home. Yeah, um, I like Santos quite a bit in this spot, and the Ooh. reason is because um, – I think, look, we've seen Blavitz in his last couple of fights um, really sort of transform himself by being just like a, a steady boxer who works behind a jab and can counter some. Um, but I think giving uh, Tiago Santos a slow kickboxing match where he can stand at range is pretty much the worst thing you can possibly do. I think he's going to get uh, lit up by, by kicks, and um, he's going to really have to – like, there's no such thing as fighting a slow-paced fight against Tiago Santos. You're going to have to fight to his pace. And I, Blakovic has, has been better about um, his gas tank because he's been fighting more measured. I don't think he's going to be able to do that here. I think he's going to get tired. And as far as the wrestling goes, yeah, he could use it. But um, Tiago Santos has very underrated jiu-jitsu. He's underrated at, at uh, you know, hitting sweeps uh, and getting back to his feet um, because he's such a, a dynamo um, on the feet. I just think that this is a a pretty um, a pretty nice matchup for a guy like Santos. Um, he could he could obviously you know eat a counter. That's always the worry in a Santos fight. But as as safe Tiago Santos fights go, and I know that's a pretty loaded sentence, but as they go, I think this is a pretty good one. So I'm picking Santos. Joe, I'm assuming you're all with the, with just your sound effects. You're with the side of this hype train here, so tell us why the masses like. Oh, Jan not a hype train. I mean, I've been on Jan, you know, all week. I mean, I I bet him in the parlay with with CDF. So you can um, be on the leader of of the hype I, train. I like uh, I like I like Jan. I mean, I was on him against Krylov. I was on him against Clark. I was on him against Manawa. I, I see this as as a absent the leg kicks. Of course, I see this as as a similar fight to Manawa. You know, going against a striker, he dominated him for three rounds. I don't necessarily see him getting the finish, but I do see him uh, kind of grinding out a decision. I do like the, the odds value here. I will have shares of of Santos um, as well. I'm not surprised that the line flipped. Um, I think there's some great value here at 7.7K. Um, I am going to pick Jan. Um, I don't think that Santos is the guy that, you know, derails his recent resurgence here. Um, this is essentially a home fight for him. Um, you know, Santos uh, flying to the Czech Republic from Brazil. Um, you know, I guess uh, I guess uh, Jan could probably take a train um, to get to the Czech Republic from Poland. Um, I am on Jan here, and now and now is a good time for me to actually give um, my my take that I alluded to, or my something I haven't seen since I started playing here DFS. We go. There are people here just for this. I know there are. There are. Okay, so here's here's what I have never seen before. Um, at current odds, there are, and you alluded to it, Sean. Like, oh, I bet you're going to say that you could play a lineup with six favorites. You can play 192 lineups with only betting line favorites in them. I have never seen anything close to that in all my years of playing DFS MMA. Um, there are 192 lineups. Are you going to play 150 of them? No, no. I mean, there I, because again, there are people out there who play DFS MMA that are pure odds driven players. Um, and if it comes out that you know six betting line favorites win, irrespective of what their DraftKings salaries are, um, it's going to be a bloodbath in terms of ties and you know, divvying up pots. So no, I mean, game theory suggests that you shouldn't go all out and do that. I mean, you know, the most you could play is up to your point is 150 of those lineups. Um, and I would not advise coming close to that for a lot of reasons. Um, but I have never seen a slate where you could play 192 lineups solely with betting line favorites. All right, so that wraps up, wraps up the analysis for UFC Prague. Let's go to hot takes. I'll give mine first because I've had it queued up this whole time. 
Joe, who who are the two biggest odds value line value plays in the card? Uh, obviously Demir. That's number one because he's uh, he's seven point four k and he's a betting line favorite. So that's one. And then it's it's uh, probably between in second. It's probably between I guess Struve and Jan. I, I think it's it's Jan. Well, yeah, it's got to be Jan because they're both the same odds to win, and Jan is cheaper. Yeah. So those two, they both get finished. Whoa. Uh, that's the hot take. That is a hot take, Chris. Well, I I think um, I I might have to change because <clears throat> Otto Otto said it in the chat first, and now uh, David is telling me that I got to pick a new one. So. Um, Wait, can we go to Joe first and come back to me? I, I'm, get, still, I'm still formulating mine, so we might. Uh, Sean, Sean, uh, Sean might, Sean might have to kill some time here. An another one. Um, hmm. Let's see. Another hot take. Let's see. For another one, I will say that the Steph. How about Stefan Struve, Marcos Ruggiero de Lima, see a third round. Ooh, that is a hot take. And then I think the fight ends in that third round. By the way. But I, I think we get to a third there. All right, I've given you guys two hot takes, two steamy hot takes. Okay, so uh, here, here's my hot take. Um, I, I am, I've been pretty good giving people parlays. Um, you know, so here is my parlay. Um, I want you guys to play Struve by submission. Struve wins by submission. Okay, that's part one of, of my hot take. And then I want you to uh, play that with um, – I'm trying to find a little value here. Um, let's go with uh, Ankalov by KO. So let's go with Struve by submission and Ankalov by KO. Parlay. That should pay pretty decently. Yep, I, I can get behind that, behind that as a hot take. All right, Chris, no, no more stalling. What do you got? All right, well, it was going to be that um, that Macedo guard subs uh, Jillian Robertson, but uh, Otto said it in chat like right before I did. So, um, uh, Come on, I got to go eat dinner. Let's go. I know, Keep but I, I, I don't have another one. Well, I don't you know. can take that because Otto is not yet on our staff, so you could you could certainly. That's true, but but you know I, I'm getting I'm getting guff in the chat over it, so I don't know. Guff, wow, you used the word guff. guff. Yeah, I, well, you got to keep it clean. You know, it's it's a family. Okay. Um, it's a family I'm, show. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I, I got to stick with it. I don't have another one on, on the. Reddit. Okay, so you're um, gonna you're gonna have Masato Masato by sub. guard subs, and it's got to be a guard sub. That'll be that'll be my the hotness of it. Okay. Gotta be a guard sub or it doesn't play. How about okay. that? It's okay. it's not it's not cheating, Zelda. How about this? Go one step further. Pick a sub. Oh, I'll oh, pick a sub. All right. Um, she gets okay. Arm bar. No, 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 no. She gets um some 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 kind of um leg lock, either a knee bar or a, or a heel hook. Okay. Really? Win girls, don't, girls don't typically win that way. Winner by heel hook counts, Zelda. I I am overriding your booze here. We will have it. That's what we got for UFC Pro. Guys, make sure and subscribe to Roto the RotoWire MMA podcast. Subscribe on iTunes and here on YouTube if you are watching live. RotoWire.com slash free 10 day free trial. Check out all the premium content. No credit card required. Give us a follow on Twitter. I'm at the DF Sniper. Chris is at Real, Real Chris Olson. Joe is at Sun Tzu. We will see you next week, guys. I'll oh, be in Vegas, Vegas, right? I'll. Uh, the card is. Is the card in Vegas? Isn't it? I mean, isn't next week the? I mean, DraftKings already has a contest out for it. Yeah, I'll be I'll be in Vegas Sunday to Wednesday. I'm coming home Wednesday morning. Ah. So, got any hot spots or tips for me? Uh, give me a shout on Twitter, and I'd be happy to hear them. And enjoy the fights this week, guys. Good luck in your contest. Sounds good.